Thank you, Doug, and uh, thank you everybody for being here and um, uh, the Cold Camp organizers. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, my uh, work is going to be in um, in Northern California, and um, a lot of you have work, uh, thought with me through this process. And I just want to thank you all uh, starting off. And uh, let's see what uh, let's see what I got so far, right? So. The study of indigeneity has long been elaborated in anthropological scholarship. Uh, it's kind of our thing, or at least one of our things. It has shown that indigeneity needs to be understood contextually as originating in the historical, political, social, and economic specificities of colonization, but also as strategically deployed by indigenous people themselves as a response to the effects of colonization on indigenous life. My research will be an inquiry into, as Sherry Ordner says, how people sustain a culturally meaningful life in situations of large-scale domination by powerful others, including prominently slavery, colonialism, and racism. Ordner contends that the study between agency and structuration, or the making and remaking of larger social and cultural formations, are revealed in the practice of everyday choices of ordinary people. Food is a perfect entryway into looking at this, as Everybody needs to eat in order to live. And most people, if they can, they tend to do so on a daily basis. Uh, Y'all just did it right now. Um, this means food waste can shed light on the relationship between agency and larger social, economic, and political structures and how people respond to them. These responses can be articulated by what Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Bisner termed survivance. Narratives and actions that focus on the practice of resilience, persistence, and survival of indigenous peoples that are demonstrated in the creative responses to colonization. Visner says survivance is more than mere survival. It is a way of life that nourishes, nourishes indigenous ways of knowing. To complement Visner's uh, literary ori orientation, I would contend that survivance can also be found in the continuity of what Mexican anthropologist Guillermo Batalla terms Mexico Profundo, uh, the contemporary presence of Mesoamerican cultural elements in Mexican life that have persisted through the modes of resistance, appropriation, and innovation. Maya people have a long tradition of survivance and are inextricably part of Mexico Profundo. They have employed resistance, appropriation, and innovation since the Spanish conquest through the colonial period and into the present day. The most visible examples of this are incidents of violent resistance, as seen during the caste war of Yucatan, an active rebe rebellion that persisted from the mid-19th century into the early 20th, during which appropriation of Catholicism and mixture with indigenous beliefs gave rise to the innovation of the cult of the Cruz Parlante, or Speaking Cross. However, survivance in Mexico Profundo can also be found in the more mundane and everyday. Using Visner's idea of a narrative of survivance, you kind of think about how survivance can be found in quieter moments. So uh, think about maybe a person in Moctezuma's court who is a little suspicious of these new people who showed up and be like, eh, I don't know about these guys. Um, and think about it as the meme that's created of that hypothetical situation on a native memes page on social media that riffs on this idea to the present, in, in the present day. And if you're talking about everyday survivance, what is more everyday than food? There is a whole lineage of food anthropology scholarship that has been devoted to looking at the intersection between food and meaning in the mundane. How eating habits reflect the symbolic dimension of social structures, particularly through everyday family meals and locally defined contexts. The need for articulating Yucatec Maya survivance today can be revealed through food. Food can be used to maintain and perform identities and political ideologies. It can also serve as a vehicle for articulating alienation from these ruling structures and resistance to them. Food has proven to be an adept proxy at showing the different ways identity, economics, politics, and meaning are taking up and their respective roles in creating different kinds of value. And this is exemplified by uh, a few months ago, this, um, this senator from the uh, current ruling party in Mexico said that eating carnitas is celebrating the fall of the Aztecs. And Mexican Twitter did not take that well. 
And so this shows how food is kind of always moving and shaping. It's, 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 a, it's an example of the cultural fluidity that we always try to grab a snapshot in as anthropologists. So, um, yeah, so food has proven uh, and that proxy at showing the, how, you know, like different kinds of value are created. And speaking of value, Karl Marx theorized that colonization of the Americas was an example of primitive accumulation of capital, which Glenn Coulthard argues was instrumental in the development and ongoing reproduction of one certain mode of production. Today, this mode of production, in its current neoliberal iteration, has resulted in economic policies like NAFTA, which has resulted in massive land loss, further impoverishment, and internal and transnational migration by indigenous peoples from Mexico. Even though Marx never said the term, I'm pretty sure that this mode of production that he was talking about, say it with me, <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> this modern industrial food system under capitalism is just one of the facets of what Nancy Shepard Hughes calls a political economic order that reproduces sickness and death at its very base. And it has negatively impacted the health of indigenous populations like the Yucatec Maya, as migration and privatization has resulted in the loss of the viability of traditional corn agriculture in the Maya area proper, Yucatec Maya diets have become increasingly dependent on calorie-dense but nutrient-poor poor, excuse me, processed foods. This shows that food is a potent symbol, analog, and indicator of wider societal struggles and focalizes abstract issues into tangible material realities. I believe that the changes and continuities in food practices are revealed in the materiality uh, of food waste and they reflect the relationship between agency and structure. Food waste can reveal a part of the structuration of the Yucatec Maya experience and what role survivance plays in constituting this structuration by way of the connection between food and wider social, economic, and political processes. What is the relationship between agency and structure in Yucatec Maya food waste? And what can this tell us about the narratives of survivance in Yucatec Maya life, especially life that has been uprooted from the places where it originated? This brings us to California. The state of precarity that many immigrants from Mexico find themselves in vis-a-vis -vis their economic status and or their undocumented status is ironically well documented. I won't go into that here, except to say that survivance continues, this time in a transnational setting. In fact, survivance is necessary, given the situation that prompts migration in the first place. In the context of the US, the anthropology of food has shown that the creation of ethnic cuisines and the incorporation of introduced cuisines provides a way to track both the histories of human migrations and the changes in the production and marketing of food that go along with it. This co-occurs with the way food informs the negotiation and social construction of identity through memory, invocation of nostalgia, and the invention and reinvention of tradition. I will trace survivance through Yucatec Maya food waste in California through two locations. First, I will work with Mayan Fusion, a restaurant in the rural coastal town of Fort Bragg in Northern California that specializes in Yucatecan cuisine with a NorCal twist where they specialize in dishes such as seared local albacore tuna served with empanadas, an example of Bataya's innovation if I've ever seen one. According to their Facebook page, Maya Fusion seeks to infuse Italian, French, Mexican, and Asian spices to recreate the meaning and taste of food. It's not your typical Mexican restaurant like most people think it is. I will also volunteer with the Asociación Maya in the city of San Francisco. Here, the Yucatec Maya proximity to other indigenous groups and organizations and to localized food justice movements that seek to reject corporate industrial, industrialized food systems have informed programs on the decolonization of diet and cultural revitalization through the conscious recovery and reinterpretation of indigenous food waste. And this is done in order to address the affirmation harms of colonization on the health of indigenous communities. These locations are important as the respective environments have put these populations in engaged interaction with other communities, prompting expressions of Yucatec Maya identity to serve different purposes through food. And this is, of course, reflected in, the, the, in uh, these two different contexts. I undertake this study to further add contribution to the movement 
to improve health of indigenous populations by going back to ancestral ways of eating and also contribute to the revitalization and revalorization of Yucatec Maya indigeneity in the United States. As the ongoing problem of climate change means that the industrial food system will become increasingly inviolable and monocrop agriculture increasingly vulnerable to diseases and extremes of weather that are increasingly becoming the norm, it behooves us to think about how we grow, prepare, and consume food as a whole, and what indigenous knowledges have to teach us about the forthcoming challenges ahead of us and what we can do about them. It is my hope that this project adds to the search for a roundtable envisioned here as a great indigenous banquet that, in the words of Nancy Shepherd Hughes, is a place where everyone can find a place at the table and share in the feasting. Thank you. You know, Anna Singh talks about the, with the mushroom, uh, with the mushroom book, how that commodification, <laughs> how commodification is only at a certain point in that in that chain, and then it becomes something else uh, at the beginning and at the end of that. Um, and um, I, I I think that looking at this kind of my efficient idea um, showcases. The you know the, the the attitudes of like uh, indigenous people that are taking this and also because they're catering in the Maya fusion case they're catering to the tastes of of uh, visitors tourists and um, so you know through interviews and also kind of you know archaeology of the contemporary I hope to kind of meld those two to find out answers to why these certain ingredients why. Um, why, uh, why? Why are they making these specific choices? And also, but also still calling it Maya fusion, still saying that there's a Mayanness to these dishes. Um, does that answer your question? Um, sure, it's a, start, it's a start. Yeah, I was just trying to think about like when you say decolonizing um, practices, like what exactly might some of those look like? That, that um, but you might kind of give us the idea of some of the methods. That Yeah, actually, this is actually what I'm saying. saying. Um, we have like three things to say very quickly. I mean, the whole idea of decolonizing food, of course, you know, assumes that there was food that wasn't colonial in the first place in the U.S. and so, right? And your beautiful and cruel image of panuchos, I guess, congratulations, right? Like, they are, <laughs> they are <laughs> perfect, like the epitome of the food that was created precisely by colonization, right? Um, to have like pork, which wasn't, you know, like a little there. So like a lot of the, the cuisine that we imagine today as like traditional is actually you know the result of complex relationship between you know colonization and different indigenous communities within Mexico, right? So yes. that's the first question I have. Maybe you can kind of understand what I'm saying. Yeah. The second point is you are evoking uh, you know a few times the work of Juan uh, Batalla, right, in Mexico, and I think I don't know. I mean, my my sense is that a lot of other people in Mexico are really wary of that. Today, partly because it, you know, it, it it creates a very essentialist idea of how does like the pure indigenous community, right? Um, but what's only in, you know, like the Yucatan Peninsula, the, the Maya communities in the Yucatan Peninsula have a lot of contact with other indigenous communities in the area, right? So you know, thinking that there's like a specific cuisine or a specific 
accomplished that they still connected just to the you know the deep Mexico that is like separated from everything else. I just think that you know there may be some uh, questions there of you know to what extent that would be useful to pursue. I think uh, for you and private. Yeah, okay, so um, thank you for that. And um, yes, uh, so for the first, sorry, what was your first question again? What was what? What was the first, uh, what was your first question again? Yeah, the first question is the idea of like a sort of pure traditional food that is like. Oh, yes, yes, okay, so. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, so some of the there's two theories that I'm kind of like taking with uh, to like explain these two aspects of you know continuity of indigenous ingredients, but also how they change. Um, and so you know the ideas of dynamic nominalism and immutable mobility. Um, so which proves that you know just because well yeah the pig was introduced to uh, to Mexico and um, now you know like cochinita vivir is something that's you know essentially you could take in, but. Um, the, because just because the Spanish introduced it doesn't mean that uh, my people did not make it their own. Sure. Um, so that's that's one of, that's, that's one ex, that's one kind of thing I'm trying to explain through these two ideas that you know a culture changes but it also continues and I'm trying to take into account those two choices under this idea of survivance and that leads to um, to the, the second question that yeah some some introduced elements there the the decolonization movement is trying to speak against. Some of these like more unhealthy foods, right? Uh, I think uh, in the Native American, co Native North American context, we talk about fry bread and how that has actually been uh, it's been a, a tool of survivance, but it's also been really detrimental to um, uh, to to native health. So, um, in particular, with this one project that I'm going to be working with in San Francisco, they're encountering this kind of challenge of yeah, panuchos are, are good, and they're like they're Yucatecan, but they're also like deep fried. So um, how do we kind of like move away from that and also like maintain this idea? And I think that the slide about the reaction to the carnitas kind of speaks about that too, which is that it's important to kind of like acknowledge some stuff that is still taken as Mexican, but also um, that. That the, the entire point of decolonization is to kind of like highlight some of these negative practices of these introduced uh, ingredients. And yeah, Bataya's work is, I mean, he uses Indian in it, and um, it's a little bit older, but I, I still think that there's value in uh, the contention that uh, indigeneity is, has persisted in all these different ways um, oh, yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. And, that. yeah, yeah, and that's, um, that's basically how I'm using this. Uh, uh, his 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 book and his ideas, but because they they merge really well with the idea of survivance. Yeah. I guess, sorry. So, so is that his work often has a very strong and like defensive boundary between sort of like modern Mexico and you know like that that has been like untouched right since like the beginning. And so I, just, I think that's what I'm trying to get. But anyway, going back to the thing about you know food sovereignty, this was a you know this was a point in. Thing about Kashi that was supposed to to defend food. <coughs> so I think that's also really interesting way of going back to what you said. March. So the question I have for you is have you shifted, or is there a strategy if you have shifted from looking at urban indigenous centers in Northern California, so let's say, or, or in California in general, let's say Oakland and Los Angeles, to looking at this Maya fusion restaurant? Because very different movements are going on in indigenous communities there are diaspora communities of pan-Indian groups sort of pulling together these different traditions that may or may not mesh and a commercial enterprise that is trying to market a particular kind of syncretic tradition. So how do you move between the two or are you moving between the two? Uh, well yeah that's the idea because I wanted to uh, address both dynamic nominalism and uh, immutable mobility, and I think that um, in the context, ironically, in the context of urban indigeneity, the continu continuity of native ingredients and the forceful return to that and revitalization of that is stronger there. Whereas in rural uh, Northern California, um, they, they're trying to take this idea of fusion to actually make survivance uh, viable in this commercial context. So, um, and also, like, I couldn't have like made up a better field site for myself. Um, so. Thank you very much. Sorry,